Camden, South Carolina's oldest inland city. The people of Camden are proud of its rich history and work hard to preserve it for future generations. Journey with us into the past and meet the people of Camden and the place they called home. The closeness to the Waterry River and its tributaries has made the Camden area a desirable home for more than 2,000 years. During the Mississippian period, around 700 to 1450, a civilization of mound builders arose in the Midwest, South, and Southeastern United States. From around 950 to 1300, a chieftain known as the Kofita Chiki occupied most of Northwestern South Carolina. Many archaeologists and historians believe that the area around Camden was the political center of that chiefdom. By the time English settlers landed in Charlestown in 1670, the chiefdom had broken up into several small groups. One of those groups, the Wateree, continued to occupy a town in the fork of the Big and Little Pine Tree Creeks until the 1740s when encroaching colonists pushed them further north and west. The Wateree eventually joined the Catawba Nation, which is located on the North and South Carolina border. Camden's strategic location on the Wateree made the area very attractive to English settlers. A trading route known as the Catawba Path, one of the oldest documented travel routes in the southeast, ran through Camden. The path travels from Virginia to present-day Augusta, and was part of a network of other trading routes that tied the interior to the coast and to points north and south. In the early 1700s, English settlers used portions of the path to move their trade goods between Charlestown, the interior of South Carolina, and further inland to other trading partners. Prior to the 1730s, European settlements remained concentrated in the coastal regions of South Carolina. As rice cultivation and then indigo became important cash crops in the Low Country, the growth of African American slavery exploded. By the late 1720s, the enslaved inhabitants dwarfed that of the English population. The colonists feared slave uprisings as much as they feared attacks by the surrounding Native Americans, the French, or the Spanish. These external and internal dangers caused South Carolina's royal governor, Robert Johnson, to propose and implement the Township Act of 1732. The colonial government designed the township plan to attract large numbers of settlers to new settlements in the interior of South Carolina. The mass immigration, primarily of Protestants from Northern European countries and other British North American colonies, would increase the white population and provide a primary line of defense for the coast from attacks launched from the interior. Surveyors laid out 11 townships, all located on key waterways and all at least 60 miles from Charlestown. Each family who settled in one of the townships received 50 acres of land per family member, a town lot, equipment, seed, and provisions. The township plan attracted thousands of settlers to the backcountry of South Carolina. As part of the township plan, surveyor James St. Julian laid out the township of Fredericksburg sometime between 1733 and 1734 on the eastern bank of the Watery River. The plat references both Pine Tree Creek and the Catawba Path. In 1751, a group of Quakers mainly from Ireland, took up land in the area. One prominent member of their community was Samuel Wiley. Wiley, a surveyor and merchant, worked with the Native Americans as a colonial agent. His friendship with the headman of the Catawba, King Hagler, was crucial to the safety of the settlement. King Hagler, who was shot and killed in 1763 by the Shawnee, is known as the patron saint of Camden. The town of Camden commissioned an iron effigy of King Hagler to serve as a weather vane for their clock tower in 1826. Today, he continues to watch over the city from his perch atop the tower. Joseph Kershaw, 
considered the father of Camden, arrived in Fredericksburg Township in 1758 to establish a store for a Charlestown mercantile firm. Soon, Kershaw and his partners in the firm petitioned the colonial government for land grants along Pine Tree Creek and other areas that they thought would be good for the development of the town. Their first plat is marked Pine Tree Hill, and the store they established was called Pine Tree Store. Eventually, the partners owned enough land to lay out the first town plan. That 1774 plan spanned the area from present-day Gordon to Fair Streets and from York to just below Waterree Street. A public square was centered at Bull and Broad. Based on the Philadelphia model, the town had extraordinarily wide streets and land was set aside for public services, a church, a market, and a fairground. The first written notice that Fredericksburg was renamed Camden was in an act of assembly of 1768, establishing a circuit court at Camden, lately called Pine Tree Hill. The name change is attributed to Joseph Kershaw, and the town was renamed to honor Charles Pratt, 1st Earl Camden, for his support of American colonial rights in the British Parliament. For the next several years, the people of Camden concentrated on establishing their homes and making their community a better place to live. Then, in 1776, South Carolina joined the other North American colonies and declared their independence from Great Britain. Although Camden's people soon declared their allegiance to either the colonies or to England, the town itself was far removed from the fighting until the British invaded South Carolina in 1780. After the fall of Charlestown, the British Army under Lieutenant General Charles Lord Cornwallis planned to occupy and pacify South Carolina and then to turn north to march against North Carolina and Virginia. To accomplish this, the British raised several units of Loyalist companies and established a series of fortifications across South Carolina. Once again, Camden's strategic location on the Watery River and as a gateway to the interior was as important to the British as it had been to the Native Americans and to the early European settlers. On June 1, 1780, Camden became one of the British Army's most important garrisons. Two months later, in August 1780, the British routed the American Army at the First Battle of Camden, where the Patriot forces suffered one of their worst defeats of the Revolutionary War. For the next five months, the only organized forces standing against the British Army in South Carolina were small bands of partisans. In April 1781, a second Battle of Camden, known as the Battle of Hobkirk's Hill, took place. Although the Continental Army was again defeated, they remained a cohesive fighting force and a continued threat to the British Army. Soon after the Battle of Hobkirk's Hill, on May 10, 1781, the British put Camden to the torch and retreated back to Charlestown. Although the war continued until September 1783, the people of Camden quickly returned to rebuild their battered city. For many, it was a time of rejoicing as prisoners of war returned home and a time for recreating the town that the retreating British Army had destroyed. A few buildings escaped the torch and they were soon joined by many others a testament to the strength and resilience Camden's people have always shown to adversity. When George Washington visited Camden during his southern tour of the new United States, Camden had rebounded. The town had around 120 residences, a courthouse and a jail, a number of stores and churches, and several taverns or public houses. Contemporaries attributed much of the prosperity that visited Camden after the Revolutionary War to the presence of several splendid flour mills located along the Watery River. The river also continued to enable citizens to do a lively trade between Charleston, the Low Country, and communities in the Back Country. While ships plied the river and a bustling ferry connected Camden to the markets in Columbia, the lands around Camden were rich with corn, tobacco, wheat, and cotton. Beginning around 1800, 
the introduction of cotton to the backcountry began to supplant other agricultural crops, and cotton mills eventually took over from the flour mills. Camden merchants drew cotton from plantations as far north as the Yadkin River in North Carolina and as far south as the Broad River in South Carolina. Camden's newspapers were filled with notices about boat arrivals and departures. A number of craft plied the waterways to bring goods into Camden and to carry off the large quantities of cotton filling the stores and streets. The inland port of Camden was booming. A 1798 plan of Camden shows a well-laid-out town with several public squares and a fairground. At this time, most of the homes and industry were located in the lower town around the original colonial-era settlement. The upper town still had marshy areas full of wildlife and just a few homes and businesses. A fire in 1813 destroyed many of the buildings in the lower town. When the people rebuilt, they moved their businesses and homes further to the north along Broad Street. It was during this period that a second community came into being just north of the city. In 1818, two years after a devastating malaria epidemic swept through the city, the Kershaw family laid out 14 one-acre lots facing a commons area on a sandy hill about two miles from Camden. They named the area Kirkwood Village. The Kershaws planned Kirkwood Village as a summer retreat for wealthy residents in the common belief that the higher elevation would alleviate the effects of the sickly summer season. Each lot came with access to a spring and the use of a common area. Many of the homes in the Kirkwood section of Camden date from the 1820s to the 1850s. They share common architectural styles that were prevalent in the antebellum South. In 1825, Camden welcomed a noteworthy visitor when the Marquis de Lafayette, hero of the American Revolution, visited the city on his tour of the United States. While in Camden, Lafayette laid a cornerstone to a monument in honor of another hero of the Revolution, Baron Johann de Cab, who died at the Battle of Camden. Just as they had done for George Washington's visit in 1790, the entire city turned out to welcome Lafayette and to honor one of the last living heroes of the American Revolution. Within just a few years, many of the homes and businesses which greeted Lafayette during his triumphant visit to the city were destroyed in the Great Fire of 1829. A contemporary account described the awful conflagration as a sweeping devastation that destroyed the whole of Broad Street on both sides from York to King Streets. In one hour, the flames enveloped the entire square when the people at last managed to put out the fire, the most valuable part of town was a heap of smoldering ruins. Yet again, the Camden community pulled together as they rebuilt their homes and stores just a little further north along Broad Street. Just as the physical fabric of Camden continued to change and grow, the population also changed. Old Camden families were joined by new residents, both from other states and from other countries. A number of Scots migrated in the early 1800s and established themselves as merchants and bankers. Irish immigrants came to work on the Watery Canal in the 1830s, and Jewish families settled in Camden both prior to and after the Civil War. Each year, as longtime residents left Camden for profitable Western lands, new residents moved in and all contributed to the vitality of the city. Camden's African-American population, both enslaved and free blacks, also continued to grow. Although the majority of African-Americans were enslaved on outlying plantations, the city had a large community of free persons of color. One well-known member of that community was Bonds Conway. Conway, born into slavery in Virginia, arrived in Camden in 1792. Within one year, Conway became the first enslaved person in Camden to buy his freedom using money he earned through various commercial enterprises. When he died in 1843, Conway left his family a legacy of endurance, courage, and respect. Another free person of color in Camden was Lafayette George. 
We learn about George from the remains of an old wallet found in the wall of the Robert Mills designed courthouse. Born in South Carolina around 1827, George was a carpenter. The notes and receipts found in the wallet included city tax receipts and store receipts for clothing and food. There were also two passes, which gave George permission to travel from place to place on good behavior for several days at a time. How frightened must Lafayette George have been when he realized his precious papers were missing. War came to Camden once again in the 1860s. Although Camden was well behind the front lines, the war touched everyone. When the fighting began, 80% of Camden's white male population volunteered to fight in the Confederate Army. While some Camden men fought with the Army in the North and West, others served in the Home Guard. On the home front, women gathered food, clothing, and other goods and sent packages to the soldiers fighting in the field. Camden was also home to a large Confederate hospital and several convalescent facilities. Six men born in Camden rose to the rank of general in the Confederate Army. A pantheon to those six generals stands in a local park. A great deal of information about the South during the Civil War came from the pen of a local Camden woman, Mary Boykin Chestnut. Chestnut, both as a much sought after hostess and as the wife of a prominent planner and politician, heard and experienced the war in a unique way. She wrote part of her journal while staying in Camden at Bloomsbury. Later, Chestnut edited her diary for publication at her home, Sarsfield. Mary Boykin Chestnut's A Diary from Dixie is a definitive commentary on the civilian view of the Civil War. After the Civil War ended in 1865, Camden's economy continued to rely on agriculture, lumber mills, and cotton mills. However, within a few years, Camden added another important aspect to the economy, which greatly aided the city's recovery from the war. From the 1880s until the 1940s, Camden was a thriving winter resort area. For decades, northern and midwestern visitors flocked to Camden to enjoy the area's mild winters and a variety of outdoor sporting activities. From early November until late April, numerous hotels and rental houses provided homes for visiting tourists. During the season, guests participated in parties, dances, picnics, hunting, polo, horse racing, and golf. The ease of traveling to Camden was another part of the city's charm. Only 18 hours from New York, conductors on the Southern and Seaboard Railways would inform incoming passengers, Carolina in the morning. Many of the visiting guests enjoyed the area so much that they purchased homes in Camden and became known as the Winter Colony. Three of the Winter Colony, Ernest Woodward of Leroy, New York, the CEO of Genesee Pure Foods Company, Harry Kirkover of New York, an avid sportsman, and Marion DuPont Scott of Delaware and Virginia, a member of the DuPont family, were instrumental in transforming Camden into a favorite training ground for both flat track and steeplechase horse racing. Kirkover and Woodward established and supported the Carolina Cup steeplechase race, while Scott continued their work with the Carolina Cup created the Colonial Cup steeplechase race and encouraged the establishment of the many training facilities still located in Camden. Members of the Winter Colony joined with year-round residents to support a number of community activities. They contributed to churches, supported the arts, participated in and encouraged the growth of the Camden Hunt and other sporting diversions, and preserved many of Camden's historic homes. The end of the 1930s spelled the end of Camden's great resort hotels, but the prosperity they created during the 20s and 30s was a boon to the people of Camden, both then and now. The 1940s brought further change to the city. Prior to World War II, Camden was home to two important pre-war military activities. In October and November 1940, more than 400,000 soldiers came to North 
and South Carolina for one of the largest field maneuvers ever held in the United States. Camden was the operational headquarters for the Public Relation Division of First Army and was host to many of the soldiers, officers, and military guests who attended the maneuvers. A number of up and coming young officers, including General George S. Patton, were guests in Camden Homes. Also in 1940, a private corporation under contract with the federal government established the Southern Aviation School at Camden's Woodward Field. Woodward Field was home to the 64th Army Air Force Flight Training Detachment. Over 6,000 American cadets and 300 British cadets passed through the Southern Aviation School from 1940 to 1944. During World War II, Camden's people committed themselves to winning the war. Men and women volunteered for the armed forces. Agricultural workers, especially in the timber industry, and mill workers were essential to the war effort. The civilian population conducted scrap drives, bought war bonds and stamps, and volunteered for the Red Cross and other relief organizations. Everyone mobilized. Everyone had friends and family fighting overseas. Everyone did their part to achieve victory. The end of World War II brought more changes to Camden, but as always, her citizens' commitment to their homes and families provided resilience and strength in the face of all challenges. After almost three centuries, Camden continues to make history.